Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you all to the 12th annual Sue McRae Lecture on Ethics and Patient-Centered Care. My name is Blair Henry, and I'm an ethicist with the Healthcare or Health Ethics Alliance here in Ontario. And um, our speaker today, which I'm really pleased to introduce, is Dr. Shelley Deb. And our presentation will be entitled, When Patient Advoc Advocacy Takes Its Toll, One Physician's Journey. I think it's really timely uh, and important talk uh, that we should be uh, addressing as both you know, the general uh, community at large, but also the ethics community. This lectureship, the Sue McCray Lectureship on Ethics and Patient-Centered Care, aims to explore the felt experience of those who are sick or unwell, perhaps in their relationship to themselves, their family and friends, their uh, caregivers, or even more specifically, the healthcare system itself. And um, the goal is really to understand how patient-centered or relationship-centered care frameworks um, and best practices are inclusive of patient and our family perspectives and can help illuminate and address common bioethical issues. Sue McRae, which I'm happy to say is here today with us, um, played an in integral role uh, and leadership role in all elements of the Joint Center for Bioethics uh, here at University of Toronto. And its mission uh, as a uh, deputy director from 2001 to 2007 Sue is and has been a champion of patient-centered ethics, an innovator in building ethics capacity, and a leader in bioethics scholarship and education. She was integral in creating a strong community of practice for the JCB during her tenure, and has played a key role nationally as well as, as being uh, acting president for this Community Bioethics Society, um, which um, is an important group for bioethics uh, movement in Canada. Before I introduce uh, our speaker today, I'd like to let you know that this lecture is being uh, webcast via Adobe Connect. Your voice will be recorded if you speak during the uh, um, discussion period. This lecture, along with others, are archived and can be accessed through the Joint Centre for Bioethics website. Uh, I want you to just kindly take a moment right now to turn off any phones that you may have uh, and reset it for either to vibrate or silence. Uh, the format of this lecture is a presentation by our speaker followed by an opportunity to have a discussion and questions uh, on, the, uh, on the talk itself. Uh, we also wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been a traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississauga, Mississaugas of the Credit the River. Today, this meeting place is still the home of many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and so we are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Shelley Dev. Dr. Dev has been a staff intensivist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre in Toronto since 2006. I just realized that we both started around the same time. Yeah, it's been a fascinating journey. Uh, after completing her internal medicine res residency and critical care fellowship at the University of Toronto, she was also able to complement her critical care fellowship with a uh, residency uh, or fellowship through the New England Journal of Medicine in Boston. And she's published uh, on her own videos through this series and continues to work in collaboration with the editorial staff at the New England Journal of Medicine. Shelley has used her video production skills in the field of knowledge translation, collaborating with colleagues on various clinical backgrounds uh, in order to create multimedia uh, educational tools around topics as diverse as lung protection, ventilation, proper hand washing techniques, communication skills, and brain death declaration. I can definitely attest to your communication skills. They're exemplary, Shelley. Thanks. Great. Um, most recently, <laughs> Dr. Deb has um, been invited to speak widely uh, about physician burnout. Uh, wellness, and me the medical culture. These invitations have included features, feature interviews on CBC Radio 1, as well as several national and international uh, scientific meetings. Shelley is an assistant professor with the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. She's also the director uh, of um, education for the Department of Critical Care Medicine at Sunnybrook. Um, so she's also very active in uh, the undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate education. Has won many awards for her, uh, for her teaching. But the key thing is, if asked, however, Shelley would say that she counts as her most significant achievement 
as continuing to convince her nine-year-old Jack and ten-year-old son Nathan that kissing their mother is, in fact, extremely cool. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Shelley. Thank you. 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 Thank
as a team in the intensive care unit, for those of you who've worked with us or worked in those settings, it's a very multidisciplinary place where there's a lot of people who are involved with the care of each patient. And as a team, we try to work together and contribute our, our opinions towards the best decision for our patients. And that's when it works really, really well. And then there are some times where that team gets fractured because we are a team of individuals and as individuals, we not only have different strengths and suggestions for our patients, we experience our patients' distress in our own ways based on what we believe our role is in taking care of the patient. So each individual person sitting there has their own part to play and their own relationship with the patient based on what they're doing. So the nurse at the bedside would say, every time I turn him, he's in pain. The respiratory therapist would say that every time I suction him, he gets tears in his eyes, and I think it's painful. The, far, the uh, nutritionist, the dietitian, would say he's not absorbing any food we give him. I don't know what else to do because his, his body was slowing down and he was dying. My most senior resident, my fellow, said, was very frustrated and would say, we're watching his body fall apart. Why doesn't his family understand that? And this feeling that there's a disconnect between what, there's, what we are seeing and what they are seeing. And what was most disturbing to me was we have a lot of uh, junior residents who come to the ICU and their job is to look after the patients and round on the patients. And I would have residents who would come up to me and say, please don't make me go in there. I can't do this, I'm having nightmares. And they and I had to decide to not permit any trainees to go in and, uh, and assess him. Um, so this is actually one of my colleagues who's now at a different hospital, but she's standing in as the, the in the picture as the attending physician, as my position at that time. And from my own perspective as supposedly the leader of the team, those feelings of distress that were expressed to me felt very much like my responsibility. And my need to advocate for this patient was also mixed with my need to support my team. And there were times where it felt like this because you could not complete rounds without somebody looking at you, whoever the physician in charge was, as what are we doing to him? Like, why are you doing this? Like, why, why are we make, allowing this to continue? And this is in the context of us having already filed with the CCB and waiting to see what to do. There was a perception I felt that at that time we were not acting quickly enough when in fact it felt that we were really hamstrung by the, by the process. So ideally, as you all know, because this is your area of expertise, when we ask our patients about decision making and what their wishes are for different types of treatment, ideally you get to ask them. And so many times, as in the case in my job, is I don't get to ask them. I don't even get to meet them as what I call normal functioning people. I get to meet them at their worst times. And you have to put together pieces of a story through surrogates. And it's a very bizarre way to actually treat your patients. So if you cannot ask your patient what the prior expressed wishes or what he, how he views his life or what he would say if he was in a situation like this, you go to his family members, and in this case it was his wife and mainly one of his children, um, and ask them, did he ever talk to you about this? And of course there's many times where people say, no, we never talked about this. Um, and then you would ask, well, do you know what he would want, knowing what he values in life and what is important to him? It seems as though he hated coming to the hospital and would refuse tests all the time. Does it seem consistent with his decision making that he would want to be on a ventilator for this long? So those were the lines of questions that we would propose. And then ultimately, do you think this is best for him? Do you think this is the right thing to do for him? And this is where we were in conflict because as the medical team, we viewed his best interests medically very different than how his family viewed them. And that was the tension. So ideally, in the ICU, our communication happens like this. This is a patient that we had years ago who uh, unfortunately had lung cancer, and he was awake, and he was on life support, but they, and we would try to keep our rounds at the bedside and talk to him with his daughter and his wife to try to engage in decision-making with them. And when he was not able to, we would you know, continue those conversations with his wife and his daughter, and that's so ideal that you're having this 
continuum of conversation that can include the patient as much as possible because this has to be a partnership. I cannot, I often tell families, I can't do any of this stuff without you because I don't know him. I don't know the kind of person he was and this is not who he is. And that relationship I've learned, I've been learning over the years is so fundamentally grounded in trust and that I can detect, and I have said many times in family meetings that I know you don't trust me and if you don't trust me, I don't know what we're gonna agree on. I don't know how to overcome this because we have to believe that we both want what's best for the patient. And in this case, we tried very, very, very hard to have conversation after conversation to try to get some sort of um, some sort of useful information about how to deal with the inevitability that he would end up on life support and not to come off. And that was that period from August to October where we talked and talked like, this is gonna keep happening because it's inevitable because his lungs and his body are deteriorating. And certainly once we filed with the CCB, this went from a situation of let's try to trust each other to an us versus them situation. And to go from trust to being on opposing ends makes this job very, very tricky and makes all the communication going forward very, very awkward on both parts. Where you could see that his family, which happens, was avoiding coming in during the day and would try to come in at night so that they would not necessarily run into the team during rounds. Um, a lot of tension, a lot of asking questions about every single medication that is being administered. On my end, my behavior was completely altered as well. I started to question things that I do for patients very routinely in order to palliate symptoms of pain and distress. And I was worried about being accused of being improper in the administration of my medication. I found conversations very stressful. I would try to avoid certain situations, of course, just to be able to get through the day. Um, so that whole relationship is completely fractured from that point, or in my experience it was. Um, and the problem with this is that with the push and pull between those two teams, the focus of the whole thing gets completely lost which is the patient, which always been about the patient. And this has become about who is right, who is doing what to whom, and about the tense relationships between the two teams. And so what eventually happens because of all this is that there is less willingness to engage at all. So not frequent updates to the family about how he's doing, not frequent bringing up is he in pain or is he not for fear that we could do anything anyway so he was certainly being deprived of the best care he could be getting and certainly being deprived of medications or interventions that would minimize his suffering so if you looked at the time in this period of time from when we filed with the CCB to the point where he actually died the costs to him were significant. He had recurrent episodes of shock. He had a lung collapse. He had a hole in his lung that was created that created a cavity because of recurrent infections. <coughs> he had horrible, horrible ulcers that revealed bone on pressure surfaces that were infected. He had bleeding from his tracheostomy because he had a tracheostomy for long-term ventilation and he was clearly in pain. The professional cost to me, if we make it out this way, in terms of time, were two pre-hearings, and one of them were over Christmas, three hearing days, three additional hearing days, these were 14-hour days, one appeal hearing, multiple family meetings to discuss our plan to propose withdrawal of life support, and in between, because I just couldn't do it, I lost clinical time, um, I had a lot of meetings with my lawyer almost daily in the last three months of the case. I knew his chart this big, like the back of my hand. Um, and I prepared my own documents for my own testimony. We decided that he was suffering more than benefiting from his care on November 25th. And that was very close to the time that we had his will. And when we saw his will, I will tell you, 
I was so devastated to see his will, to think that he had put together this document and then what for. I felt so horrible about that. So when we filed, it's to me it was the official time where we said there is more suffering than benefit for him. And he died on May 27th. And if you make those days where there's more suffering than benefit, it's 183 days of more suffering than benefit, where we as his medical team, and people said this very clearly, and I felt this very clearly, we're not upholding what we promised to do for him by our vows, by our commitment to our profession. So the dictum of abstain from whatever is harmful was, was impossible. On a daily basis, it was impossible. And we do lots of things, which I'll talk about later, to kind of make it through these moments. Um, but being in the middle of that and being in the middle of a hearing where you are trying to prove that you have no ulterior motive except to be advocating for the patient is very, very horrible. And the people who are bringing these cases forward, people like me, they're doing it with the support of many people, but the people who are doing it, or the physicians or whoever at the center of it, are doing it because they actually feel they're not doing their job properly. And that's why they're doing it, because the amount that goes into doing it, there could be no other reason except that you think that this is the right thing to do. But the real experience of what it feels like looks something like this. So it's very lonely. It's very, very lonely because you end up being, there's one person who petitions on behalf of the whole team right the way it's set up now and there's this feeling that your whole practice and the way in which you look at medicine and the way in which you treat your patients is now being completely scrutinized and combed through every single piece of it so questions that i would have to answer is are you certain you did everything to cure him to fix him did you miss anything and so the implication in the hearings was that did anybody make a mistake and that's what it feels like. I don't know that that's the intention, but it feels like that people are looking for mistakes. Somebody who took an easy route, somebody who took a shortcut, somebody who was callous and did not pay attention to this patient. That's what it feels like when you're, when you're there. And I'm not saying that that's the intent, but it certainly feels that way. Other things that come up are other comments from other people. My colleagues who were wonderful would say to me because of this last for months and months would say things like i don't know how you're doing it i would never put myself through that and i know that was meant as a kind of a compliment as you know good for you and it made me so angry because to me i looked at it as i was looking after him when we found this will and i'm the one looking after him now and this is my turn to present this case as anyone would. And when comments like that were made, I felt like I felt as though, wait a minute, I guess not everybody would. I thought I was doing this for all of us. I really did. Um, so when those comments were made again with the best of intentions, I really believe, they made me so angry. They made me so angry. Um, just trach and peg him and try to get him out of here. Meaning, if you convert his endotracheal tube to a tracheostomy, and you convert his temporary feeding tube to a permanent feeding tube, we can send him to a long-term care facility and he will cease to be our problem. That was other pieces of advice I got from other colleagues. Um, and again, if you look at the intention behind all of these things, that isn't somebody who's necessarily callous. It's probably somebody who's become callous, mm -hmm. right? And has learned that the only way to survive this is to stop caring so much. The people who are affected most deeply, aside from you, are your family. And my, the most important person in my life is my husband, who's also a physician. And one morning when I was getting ready to go to one of the hearing days, and these would be long days and I would be very anxious about it, um, I was getting out of the shower, and I won't forget, getting out of the shower, and he says, I'm so proud of what you're doing. Promise me you'll never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and he saw uh, me comp really unravel. I've said that I have worked in the ICU being massively pregnant and nauseous and tired or whatever, but the only time in my life driving to work where I had to pull over and vomit was on the way to one of these hearings. And my children were in the car, 
Oh. <laughs> and I mean, it was worth it just to irritate them. But, like, <laughs> but I throw up, and they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm fine, it's all good. And you know, drop them up and go off to a, another day. It was really rattling for me. So then, when we present the final day of the hearing, we hear that we won the decision. And I got texts and messages from all of my colleagues saying, good for you, you won, it's over. And that made me the sickest of all because all I could do was think about his wife, who was also elderly, hearing impaired, visually impaired, which made testimony extremely challenging. Um, and all I could think of was she would take two buses to come to the hospital every single day. What is she gonna do? That's all I could think about. I felt sickened by the whole thing, and I just felt sad. I just felt so bad about the whole thing. Um, and I obviously wonder what happened to her because that's what she would do every day. And so what is she gonna do now? The personal tumult of this experience um, really wreaked a lot of havoc on my sense of what my job is and um, what is involved in advocating for your patient and why is it so hard to try to do the right thing for your patients. Um, you know, if you kind of stick to a simple dictum of first do no harm, um, I had to ask myself is that I was personally harmed by trying to do no harm <laughs> and is that what this means? Is that the true sense? Like when we're evaluating our trainees, there's this column that goes patient advocate and you check off these stupid meaningless boxes. And the truth is, is, is that sometimes it can be absolutely painful. And that's what that experience was like for me. And then there's another interesting part of the story and it has to do with um, timing. And I'm almost embarrassed to say about how much of my academic career has been informed by just good timing. I've been uh, like a, a huge beneficiary of good timing. Just, just a few weeks before we filed with the CCB, and I was about to go into this rabbit hole, and I didn't really know what to expect, and it was gonna start. Just a few weeks before that, I was invited to be a keynote speaker at a resident retreat, and it was very like it was a very um, flattering invitation. And I was so flattered to do this, and I had remember atten remembered attending this retreat when I was a PGY2, and I thought, oh my God, they're asking me, and you're supposed to regale them with tales of physicianhood and stuff like this. And they told me though that they wanted uh, me to talk to the residents about wellness and not the concept of wellness or the data around wellness, but my own experience with wellness, as in, tell us, Dr. Deb, how do you keep so well? And I gathered from how they were describing this, they did not want to know about how I took care of my skin. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a deeper question, and it was one that, and I don't think I'm alone in saying this, I never sat down to think about. I never sat down and took the time to think about what does being well even mean to me? So through an obscene number of rewrites and drafts, I had to contend with this inescapable truth about my life, which is at that time, I had only recently emerged from a period of being very, very unwell. It was shortly after I finished my training, this three year period that turned my life upside down, which was when just after having had my two sons less than two years apart, my father was diagnosed with and died of cholangiocarcinoma. And my heart broke right when it was supposed to be at its fullest. And I was so lost in my sadness and so trapped by the responsibilities that come with parenthood. And I was terrified of going back to work to a place where conversations around death and suffering were ubiquitous. But I had to somehow return to my life I was a wife and a new mother, a daughter, a sister, a friend, a physician, a colleague, a teacher, but the despair was so paralyzing to me that I had no idea how I could possibly do that. So my route to clarity, or just a place to actually exhale my fear and sadness, was in an office with a psychiatrist. Working toward recovering from this abyss took three years of therapy. It took medication for anxiety that I probably had my whole life. And it was a lot of painful, gut-wrenching hard work and it saved my life. And only after 
I was asked to think about my own wellness and mental health by this group of residents who invited me to speak to them, was I able to see the most fundamental realization that came from those really awful years, which was that doing good for other people is a very hard work and it can often be painful. And we as providers have never learned how to reckon with and process that weight in a productive, healthy way. My role at, the, at my hospital is as a clinician educator, that's my academic title, and my administrative role it involves meeting with a lot of medical students, residents, and fellows for many reasons around their education. So it'll be for teaching, feedback, evaluation, mentorship, and by far, my most favorite group to meet with is medical students. And I used to think it was because I seem significantly smarter than them. <laughs> but, you know, when I kind of dug a bit deeper, uh, I see that it's something else entirely, which is it's because they are the closest people we have to civilians in medicine. They remind me of my early feelings when I entered medicine when most of my aspirations were formed by curiosity and goodness and the desire to help. When I meet with residents and senior fellows, my feelings become more complicated because they are becoming more complicated. And I can see the last remnants of the civilian disappearing. I, I remember it. And they're becoming medical professionals, not as we may formally define a medical professional in guidelines or objectives, but according to our cultural definition, how we live it and demonstrate it to our learners. And professionalism, if we were to study the behaviors of people in the medical environment, this cultural space, it's likely best described as putting on your game face and sucking it up and getting your work done no matter how you feel or no matter what's going on with you. Do your work. I've even heard myself say that to people, leave your shit at the door. And it's often a point of pride how good we are at putting the job before everything else in our lives. And we've all implicitly agreed that this is the hallmark of an excellent healthcare worker, that this is a reasonable way to think about our work and ourselves. And we've all learned this throughout our training, our careers, and over many years in this business. It's what we all call coping. And this process of coping starts very early on in medical training. The most horrific thing a medical student could imagine when they arrive on a clinical rotation for the first time is anyone noticing them at all. They are in survival mode. And when you're the newest animal in a well-established jungle, the best way to figure out how to survive and avoid being eaten is you watch the dominant animals running the place and you do what they do. So if your senior resident is arguing with other doctors about dumb consults, I guess that's what you do when you get a consult and you don't want a consult. And if the team praises people for getting the DNR with high fives and way to goes, then that must be a good thing to try to get. And if your attending physician thinks it's funny to make disparaging comments about patients or other physicians and other specialties, that must be a reasonable thing to joke about. But I know, having asked this question to anyone who can remember themselves at this time in their development, when they saw that kind of behavior for the first time, almost immediately they knew something wasn't right. They felt uncomfortable. Their gut told them that the joke wasn't funny. They felt uncomfortable watching two people fight over who gets stuck with a sick patient. And they were overcome with sadness when someone they looked after had died. But the question you could ask them is, what are you going to do when that happens? Are you going to cry? This is a tough place, my friend. Do you not have what it takes to do this work? Do you see anybody else crying? So instead of listening to that slowly disappearing civilian, and instead of expressing sadness when sad things happen or, when discom or discomfort, when disparaging comments are made about vulnerable people, at some point you suppress it and you fall in line. And with these tacit lessons learned, you keep moving up in your training. There are more expectations and with them more freedom 
to make some weighty decisions and a lot of bad choices. You who were the influenced become the influencer and carry on the tradition. It's the tradition of making inappropriate jokes, getting angry at people, being rude, cynical, and maybe just not feeling anything at all anymore. You carry on the hallowed legacy of coping. We all did. And here we are now with our critical levels of whatever you want to call it. Burnout, distress, disillusionment, depression, apathy. We've coped ourselves to, into a crisis. Clearly, we're all coping far too much instead of addressing the real question, which is, why do we need to cope in this way? What are we not dealing with more constructively? The answer to that came to me from the most useful resource on human behavior that I have ever read. And these are parenting books. When I was on my second maternity leave, my older son had not yet turned two, and that's because you can get pregnant when you breastfeed, so just write that down. <laughs> so I have two kids at home. One of them is starting to talk. He's a year and a half, and he's talking. And then there's a little baby, and the little, the older one, who's almost two, is finding language, right? And so I was submerging myself under this pile of books of how to talk to your two-year-old. And these books speak to the most primal of our feelings, and children express them the most openly. They have no guile. So what you're supposed to do, say these books, is you're in the middle of a grocery store and your kid is freaking out, and you're supposed to crouch down to this child so that you don't look like you're looming over him, and you look at him in the eye, and you're supposed to emulate his sense of distress, and you're supposed to say, wow, you look so mad. Why are you so mad? And you're supposed to punch mad <laughs> so that they pick up on mad. And then the kid goes, I'm mad because, and you're like, just fucking put down the soy sauce so that nobody breaks anything, right? <laughs> you're like, great, honey, you're mad. And then, you, and then it ends. But the kid is supposed to calm down because they've been heard, they have a word to describe how they feel, so they don't need to cope anymore with this anger. That's the idea, right? Okay, so I was in, you know, toddler speak prison for about a year, right? And then I come back to work, and I'm in the ICU, and as any busy hospital, there is a premium on beds, and like people need beds, and that's the stress. So I'm in, one, in our cardiovascular ICU, and I see one of my surgical colleagues who comes out of the operating room. And he's coming out at a particular time, and I can tell he's coming out because he's about to start his second case of the day. And he sees, he goes to the board where all the patient names are, and he sees quite quickly that there is no empty bed where his patient would go into. So he's thinking, well, where am I going to put my patient, right? So he calls over the charge nurse, and the charge nurse comes over. And I'm a distance away, so I'm just watching all of this, right? And she comes over, and she's got a clipboard, and he's pointing at the board, and she's looking at the clipboard as though the clipboard's going to create a bed for her. <laughs> and she's looking down, and he's getting, like, really, really, you know, like this with her. Uh, kind of, you know, looks like he's getting a bit aggressive. So I go over there, and very automatically, without thinking at all, I go, wow, you look so mad. <laughs> <laughs> and I and he goes and he goes what and I go why are you so mad and he goes yeah I'm mad I go I can tell what's going on and he says well I have to start my second case I don't know if there's a bed so I might have to tell the patient to go home to come back another day if I can't do the case and the patient came and they're all ready and it's you know it's it's awful if we have to do that and I go oh that sucks that would make me mad too right and he goes yeah and then he leaves. <laughs> Right? And the, he goes away, and I'm kind of, it was very eerie and bizarre. And then my, my charge nurse looks at me, and she says, I know it's being recorded, but I have to quote her. She looks at me, and she says, what the fuck was that? <laughs> right? And I go, I don't know. I think that's how I talk now. <laughs> so the reason, I've told that story many times, and it's just like, I love that story because it's funny. But... It also reveals the truth about the most put-together people 
you know or have ever met or have ever seen that look like they've got it all figured out. They're a mess. <laughs> we're all a mess and we rely on caffeine and expensive grooming products to look like we're not. That's just how it is. We don't know what to do with these big feelings. We never learned about what to do with them. If we want to start living more healthily in this profession, we need to be unafraid about being candid about it. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's stressful and painful and it can make you mad. So when I sat down to write this speech, this is what I came up with. And this is what I told them at this retreat one week before filing my CCB case, before another descent into chaos. So I honestly told them that the secret to my well-being was that I had secretly been unwell for a very long time and had to come out of it. Immediately the reaction to that speech completely overwhelmed me. There were tears, there were expressions of gratitude and un, almost unreasonable amount of praise from my colleagues. And it was very difficult to absorb all of that because I could not believe the intensity of the emotion in that room. I was not prepared for that reaction. I felt very happy and proud that people appreciated it. And of course, I filed it away as a very rewarding experience and a good exercise that I'd gone through. But the conversations about that speech carried on outside of the retreat and reached the Faculty of Medicine. And I was asked by their communications department if they could publish my speech as an essay for distribution to the alumni of the faculty through an email, as in alumni news. So now I was convinced that like me, everyone deleted those emails. So I thought it was a low risk situation that sure, you can publish this because no one's gonna read it, so you're welcome. Um, and then, it's <laughs> keeping me alive, okay. <laughs> and then, within hours of that essay being posted, my life completely changed and it's never been the same since. The hundreds of emails, messages, impromptu hallway conversations from and with doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, social workers, ethicists, CEOs, medical students, residents, fellows, men and women, all ages, all over the world, all of whom who shared with me their own stories of struggle and sadness and loneliness and shame while trying to do their best at work, it left me just stunned. And precisely as I was weathering this CCB storm, I started traveling all over the place talking about burnout and mental health and well-being because I had become the goddess of wellness. <laughs> Sharing ideas and stories with people to whom life happened when they were busy making other plans, so the saying goes, an inevitability for all of us. This was moving and empowering and comforting and inspiring. And those connections were imperative to my being able to endure the emotional torment of that case. So to me, when I heard about these people, they were stories of resilience. And it's not surprising to me that on the heels of the wave of burnout and wellness data that started to come out, it became very topical to discuss personal resilience. And I myself was speaking about this on several occasions. I spoke endlessly about the importance of self-compassion and needing to prioritize recovery from work. And this is where the conversation went for quite some time. It was. What can the individual do to become more resilient in the face of the stresses of this work? And in an attempt to solve the problem, because we like to fix and treat, you would see hospital bulletin boards and university bulletin boards everywhere being littered with notices for mindfulness workshops and yoga classes and handouts on the multitude of uses for chia seeds. <laughs> and it turns out you can make pudding with them. But the message was, you need to take more time for this good and healthy stuff to take better care for yourself. And of course, you need to sleep more. And that worked for a bit, I think. I think it got people thinking, it got people motivated, but not for long. Fairly quickly, burnout and wellness have become buzzwords, I think, losing their potency in real time as we were overwhelmed with Band-Aids instead of healing and true change. I think we're in trouble. 
and I think we all know it. We've resigned ourselves to lives where we work way too much. We take too little time to recover from the emotional and physical burdens of the work we do and lose touch with the original mission this whole gig was about in the first place, which was to help people. We are coping to just survive, not to thrive. I think these coping mechanisms are making us unwell and unhappy, and this is not good for the people we're supposed to help or the people in our lives that we love. I've told my own personal story so many times, and for the most part, I very much focused on this being a personal narrative. It's about one person, and I would call it things like a physician's journey or one person's journey, so I wouldn't speak for everybody. But stories like mine, if you look closely at them, are more than the central character. They'll have to do a lot with the supporting characters. The sheer salvation of the words, Shelley, something is wrong, came from my family doctor and colleague who has known me for over 20 years. I discovered therapy when a mentor of mine made an unprompted offer to help me find a therapist. I got through some truly unnerving panic attacks in the ICU when two nursing colleagues and friends of mine who've been through the same and know me well enough knew I just needed to know they were there for me if I needed them. And I had physician colleagues in my department who made it clear to me from my very first day of work that I could call any time, any time, if I needed them, and I know they meant it because they have been there for me. These are the same people who got me through the endless days of preparation and testimony for the case when my personal resilience was not enough. I didn't navigate any of these hurdles alone. It wasn't even close. And when I think back to the stories that have been shared with me by those many brave and generous people over the years, they have gone from being examples purely of personal resilience and to ones that are also about community. Those people became a community of support for me when I needed it by writing to me. Some of their stories contained wonderful examples of receiving support too when they were going through a crisis. That is the vast minority. The majority of these stories were about isolation and shame and despair that follows when one feels unsafe sharing their struggles with people at work. The most cruelly and consistently perpetuated myth in our world is nothing should bother you if you're good enough to work here. And if it does, maybe there's something wrong with you. Our silence around the very struggles plaguing so many of us in this profession allow this myth to persist. I'm not ignorant of the systemic factors at play that make it hard for us to be healthy. Most of these are so weighty, they feel immovable. Funding, insufficient space and resources, high patient volumes, lack of diversity and representation in leadership, unrealistic expectations of what medicine can do for people with chronic illness. That is a list so vast, it's actually distracting in its vastness and a perfect setup for apathy and hopelessness for true change. And I don't want to speak about our powerlessness or how to tolerate what has become intolerable for many of us. I'm here because I want us to change the way we envision change itself. I'm done with waiting. Our culture, our sense of community is greatly impacted by how we choose to define our values, how we relate to one another. We each have a part to play in creating meaningful positive change and helping one another heal and grow and thrive. And I think these are things that we can do right now. So the first thing that I propose, we first step I propose we take is to do something that I call stop comparing war wounds and instead start sharing remedies. Moving our culture towards one of support means moving away from the contemptuous, things were way worse when I was training, sentiments that only serve to isolate people. It means disposing of the profoundly disrespectful tropes of surgeons never do X, or psychiatrists always do Y, or family doctors never know Z, these baseless stereotypes that further alienate us from one another. And for the record, I have been as guilty of this as anybody. We don't need to compete for hardships, or busyness, or stress. We're all a mess, and I've told you we are. We've all won, and we've all lost, and it's time to call it a draw. What we need to do is make things better for one another by admitting we all go through difficult times and share strategies for emerging stronger. The next step 
I propose we take in our cultural rehabilitation is we must genuinely look after one another. We need to talk, we need to listen, and we need to support one another. Look at the person that you are worried about and ask the key question, are you okay? We don't have to endure these all too common and still too secret moments of struggle alone, and we can't survive them alone. In my case, what sounds like one person's experience is also an account of the many attentive interveners who led me to recovery and renewal and knowledge and strength. All this by what I like to call going first. They invited me to their help. I've lost count of the number of times a work colleague I barely know will come up to me and immediately start talking to me about therapy and their own stress and struggle. And it takes me a few seconds to realize, oh, this person I barely know is telling me this because this person I barely know already knows my story. And to this person, I went first. And he knew that he could start the conversation from there. Why else would anyone feel safer sharing a story of struggle with a relative stranger than someone they work more closely with? Because as good professionals, remember, it's not safe to share these things. We're supposed to leave them at the door. Well, the Santa Claus moment is, there is no door. There is no internal separation between who you are in and outside of your workplace. All of it is a part of it. It's all you, every glorious, shiny, broken part of it. And all of it makes, it good, makes you good at what you do. Professionalism is not about putting on your game face. Being a professional means knowing yourself and all the variables affecting who you are and how you feel and how that impacts your ability to do the work that you love. And there are times when we will lose this insight and we will not listen to our families and our friends who are urging us to take a break. And we need our colleagues, the people that we share in this journey with, to tell us, you don't look okay. What do you need? Can I help you? Sharing our stories and strategies, creating an atmosphere of support, going first with offers of help, all of these are steps we can take as individuals in a greater movement towards meaningful culture change now, today. What I'm proposing is a better vision for collegiality and culture and community, professionalism and patient advocacy. And this is the change I pledge to be part of from now on. And all I ask is that you consider it consider the part you personally play to remediate our workplace culture so we can do this good work as healthier people. And after that, let the chia seeds fall where they may. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Shelley, for going first. Um, <laughs> So we have a few minutes uh, to, uh, to engage in conversation and questions and answers, so please speak up loudly so that uh, the microphone can hear you, but uh, uh, I'm sure that Shelley would be very pleased to engage. Yes, sir. Hi, Shelley, I really enjoyed that. Uh, I'm Chris Mindell, one of the cardiac surgeons at Toronto General Hospital. I don't think I've faced that nurse yet. That <laughs> what? <laughs> but, uh, I have an interesting just an interesting thought. When you think back to how we were trained, my father was a neurosurgeon. I watched what his life was like. And yet I don't remember the term burnout. I don't remember all these terms. And surely back then, mm -hmm. their life was in many respects as stressful, if yep. not more. Yep. And I've been sort of puzzled why this has changed. And a number of theories have come up. One of them I'm sure you're aware of is the introduction of digital information, the tremendous amount of time and effort we have to put in to entering data. None of us went to medical school to enter data. We went to medical school to learn to look after patients. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you think it's just a, an increased awareness of what's going on today? I think it's both, because if you look back, the earliest articles about this kind of thing, or this felt phenomenon, is from like the 70s. I, there's a paper in JAMA that talks about the hidden secret of substance abuse in physicians, right? And this is, you know, far enough back that this is one of those things that people did to cope. 
right? And so I do think that culture has evolved to the point where you can try to talk about these things because we're supposed to be more sensitive to issues about mental health, though we don't apply them to ourselves at all. I think the other piece is that our patients are different now too, right? Like I think aside from all of the technology, even this term of patient-centered care and the empowerment of the patient switched the paradigm, I think, of the relationship between the physician and, and the patient, right? And in terms of how much more engaged you're gonna be with them and how much more time that's gonna take and how many more questions you're gonna get and how much more you know, stressful that is. I think it is. It's not as simple as this is what I do and this is what I'm gonna do for you. It's this is what I'm proposing to do. What do you think about it? You know? And I so I think the job has gotten more layered, especially in terms of how we communicate with patients. I think our patients are living longer with chronic disease and they're sicker. I think everyone would agree the volume of patients is so much higher. Um, I think all of those things are, they've collided. But I think the way we spoke about it also has changed. I think the ways people dealt with it was far more destructive in the past. And we just wouldn't speak of it. Um, and although we moved more, this issue about mental health and physicians is not an open conversation. It just isn't. And it's very troubling to know that it's out there that we talk about this stuff, but there's a significant amount of fear about talking about this still. So I think it's a lot of things. I'm gonna have a hard time giving you a comment without being tearful. Oh, actually, I'm really moved by this. Oh, yeah. Thank you. It really touches on the spirit of what I've experienced in healthcare over the years and what has always driven my own personal motivation to patient centered care has been the lack of conversation at this level about what you're speaking about. You know, the the humanness of us as clinicians and the way that interfaces with the humanness of the people we care yeah. for and with. Yeah. And it seems and always has seemed kind of strange to me that that isn't more clear and out in the open or and accessible. accessible even. And then I think the other layer of that is the way as peers we have protected that in some kind of secrecy bubble so that if someone does dare to speak up about their pain or about their struggle that somehow you know they ought to get absorbed back in the bubble or they get tossed out of the bubble and so I just I really want to thank you for your bravery and your work and I hear that it's come you've come to it from a place of authenticity and lived life experience that has informed it but it's it's very uh, Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, I feel so self-conscious about the about being called brave because I'll tell you if I had known how many people were going to read that, I don't think I would have said the <laughs> Because I don't have any social media, so my instincts around this were wrong. But um, it's it's you know it's kind of um, that was not my expectation. And I, even when I first talked about it, I think you probably get a sense I, I'm more comfortable being honest than not. And um, that just felt very genuine for me. It felt very much in character for me to speak about this stuff in that way. I will also say that by talking about things that you've gone through that are typically stigmatized, you lessen your own personal stigma about it. Like, um, I, it's hard to talk about. I mean, I revisit things when I talk about them. But if I talk about them, there's this part of me that believes that I'm okay with it, you know? That I'm, there's nothing wrong with me. That's right. That I, I, I went through something very real that a lot of people go through, but it's my way of reassuring myself of that, because I have a remnant of that. So. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. That was wonderful. Um, I am not a healthcare professional. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. I know. You're <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> messed up anyway. <laughs> 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 you are speaking directly oh, to me. You know, I can detect the souls in the sort of process. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. So, I wonder your thoughts on this. Yeah. When I, I have two things. When I'm uh, in, within the healthcare system and I'm feeling well, and I detect something going on with my healthcare professional. I love it. 
I am inclined to do the partnership thing and treat them like a human being and say something. Say perhaps you could use some kindness or you must have a hard day. Oh, yeah. Yes. I get pushed back from healthcare professionals all the time on this and just wonder. You, you give me pushback and you <laughs> <laughs> That's position I do. Oh, okay. Really? Yeah, because it's not my role to be. Uh, so, you know, I started to say, like, of course, I spent a significant amount of my training and early parts of post training deciding who was an asshole and who wasn't. Right? <laughs> and then when you grow up a little, you realize that 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 narrative of good guys and bad guys is so reductive it's too simple right people aren't like this but we tend to do this right well i'm the good guy and anyone who doesn't agree with me is a bad guy so i stopped believing in assholes and i started believing in bad days <laughs> right where there's you know and anytime i look at misbehavior i call it misbehavior all i'm thinking is what happened to you like what is happening right and i think I am married to the most wonderful human in the world who is emotionally retarded. <laughs> okay? I love him. He's like the perfect person in my life. But it's so uncomfortable talking about how he feels. And he has told me many times, he has said, Shelly, you have to be okay with people not being comfortable speaking like this. You have to understand that for some people it's terrifying. And I can see it in him. And even though he wants to be able to feel comfortable expressing things to the person he knows the best, I can see physically in him this is hard, right? And I think for some people, I totally believe this, is, is too painful. It's too painful to be that open. There's a lot in there, right? But what happens eventually, and I think I know this by talking to people who are like 20 years ahead of me in the profession. I don't know how revealing this is, but a lot of them are men who have come up to me who have quietly approached me after a talk, after in my own hospital, just, you know, and will say to me very tearfully that I feel like you were looking at me when you were talking, mm -hmm. right? This has happened to me at least 10 times. Wow. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really, um, one of our friends did the same thing, who pulled us into a talk, mm -hmm. okay? And um, it's very, very, startling and surprising to me and then you know it makes me think of how hard that is that is hard to keep that up i think that's really really hard you know and um but i think it's very difficult to um kind of abandon those protective things like i don't know any psychiatry i'm just a fan girl of psychiatrists but like they the, you know whatever that takes i can tell from my most trusted partner in life i can see that is really really hard and, but I, I, I think you should still do it because there will be somebody who will weep with, with appreciation. Like I would, I'd be a mess in your lap. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you, I'm gonna extend that to, to you too because I think all the stuff that you're talking about um, related to you guys also um, is relevant to we who are in the position of your poor patient and the family, we, right? Yeah. We, we, we don't know yeah. what we want, mm -hmm. what we do. We want to get back to normal, right? Yeah. Well, we Everybody can. wants that. And well, it's, it's a very, this, is, this has been me trying to, I've tried, I wrote something for the Globe and Mail about trying to, in the midst of going through the worst things of your life, trying to uh, get away from the binaryism of the medical team wants this and we want this, mm -hmm. but rather, like I, I talked about this term called pulling the plug. When I've heard people say that in meetings, and I started to say, you know, I'm kind of allergic to the term because it implies something so simple. And in my job, there's probably nothing that people, and nurses in particular, are more fixed and controlling about than getting that right to palliate somebody. There's, there, I think that is the one thing if someone is being palliated and dying, that our team takes so seriously, right? And the thought that there is no sadness experienced from your team members or regret or hope for something better for you, that that didn't exist, that would be such a misrepresentation, right? Um, so it's tricky to talk about the life of the healthcare person in the context of a patient going through something, and I wouldn't compare it, and I, and I don't think they're the same at all. But it is real. I think it's a real thing. And I think that 
I, I would I would think that it would. But the, the, the most important thing that happens to me is when I when a patient dies and it's sad, obviously and unexpected in particular, I tried to do something and it didn't work, and and I'll say, I'm sorry I couldn't help, like I'm sorry I couldn't fix this, and then somebody says thank you to you. <laughs> that makes my head spin quite a bit because it's taken me a while to understand that, and I think it's thank you for being with us, right? Thank you for trying. Thank you for sitting with us. Or it's like you're just being present with them. And you didn't give them what they wanted, but they still were, they still perceived something that you were giving them. And um, that matters to me a ton. Like that's where I get my motivation. I can't get it so much from people doing great, right? So um, that, that, that's all that matters, that they, they believe that you really wanted to help them. Right? So, thanks. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. That was a terrific talk. I was going to tell you a very brief story, and I love your response to it. So, I worked as a palliative care physician at St. Michael's Hospital, and I was on call over the New Year's week and um, ran into one of my colleagues on the medical floor, and we were just kind of, you know, it was New Year's Eve, and we we're saying, gosh, you know, we're here working. And this person turned to me and he said, like, and it kind of shocked me. He said, you know, I find the best, the best treatment for burnout is providing really good patient care. And I went, like, whoa, you know, because as a physician who, you know, works at U of T, we are talking so much about the very real issue of burnout. But here was this guy saying, man, when it works well, it's awesome. there's nothing like it for my own personal well-being. And it's why, to previous times, why I got to be a doc. And it, in some ways, it was such a sad comment to me, right? Because, because <laughs> yeah. that's sure well, probably one of the reasons we're feeling so burnt out is that, that we aren't able to provide really good patient care. But anyway, I'd just be interested in your comment about that. And I think you were almost well, replying to it when the patient said thank you, or the, the yeah, family said well, thank you, right? So it's, I think, so I've been asked by people who are like in charge of hospitals, like, what do you think of all of this? And then I say things that are not really popular, but I think they're important, which is um, your workers are us, right? And I'm trying to talk about us taking control of what we want our community to feel for each other, right? And saying, if we decide we want to enjoy work. Like I told this story once about my son, two sons, I'm driving them to school on a Monday, which to them is like a funeral drive, right? <laughs> and they're super like depressed, which is overly dramatic for me. And, and I said, can you guys just find something that you're looking forward to at school? So my little one, Jack, who's in the blue over here, he's like, I love recess. I'm totally excited about recess. So then I go to Nathan, who's the older one, and I go, what about you, Nate? What are you looking forward to? And he goes, nothing. I'm just trying to survive. <laughs> like, right? Right. And so then I ask, you know, I ask the question, is it reason? So it bothers me as his mom because he spends so much time there. I want him to enjoy it, right? And then I think, yeah, his work is school. He spends a huge amount of time there. Is it unreasonable to expect that he enjoy it? And then I ask, you know, my colleagues, like, do you think we should be trying to find enjoyment, right? Isn't that reasonable? And what is it that we enjoy? You know what I enjoy? Like you said, the medicine is fun. It's interesting, right? I love seeing my friends. <laughs> I love running into my friends at work. I love it, right? I love having an interesting conversation with a patient. And the things that get in the way of that, right, are bad behaviors that challenge that civility and challenge that commitment that we are all going to help each other to enjoy this. And so when CEOs or whoever ask me, I say, get rid of your troublemakers. Because you and I and this other physician can be like, we just want to do our thing, right? And do the best we can and let's look out for each other. And you can do that until you're blue in the face. And if you're being governed in a department or whatever the hell it is by somebody who is not on side, it's not going to work. It just won't, right? And I think that that is a key piece that is not popular to talk about, but harassment or bullying or incivility, uh, abuse of any sort, that shit has to go because
We are all willing to boost each other up. And it's not so that we can fall apart again. It just isn't, right? All of that trickles down. It's just like the example we're setting for junior people of what it means to be a professional. They need to know what it means is you got to take care of yourself and your colleagues. That's the best way to be a professional. That's how you find the joy again, right? That's my perspective. I'm sorry. I'm being a little ragey about it. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So we have a couple of, or at least one or one. two questions set from the online. Uh, yeah, community. and then I think maybe time for one more after that. Um, so Jed has a question. Um, he says, thanks for sharing your personal insights. He spoke of resilience as an ecosystem level phenomenon and not only an individual trait or skill set. One framework I'm familiar with that attempts to do this is the Rockefeller Foundation City Resilience Framework. Are there any other models you might point to as a potentially relevant to healthcare organizations and professionals? For resilience? Um, so there's a lot of, I don't, there's a lot of programs in the states. They've created these, it's become kind of a cottage industry, right? So you can, you know, pay some money and sit through modules or workshops on how to be resilient, and they're kind of, they're easy to find online, and I don't know them off the top of my head, but the unifying principle for resilient stuff that I have read, all of this stuff, like most smart things, come from studies in children, right? And what they do is they look at children who both, two different children who have the same socioeconomic status, the same pressures in life, and the same stresses they've been exposed to. One kid thrives, and the other does not. And what is the difference between the two? And then that interest in, what is it about the kid who thrives with the same resources and the same limitations or advantages? How do they do it? And in looking at, can you learn to be an optimistic person? Can your perception be made to be optimistic rather than self-defeatist? What are those things in those people's lives that protect them? It's relationships. Right? It's relationships with people that are important to them so that they're not isolated from other people. Right? Um, so there are these consistent things that no matter what literature you read on it, they will come up with it. In children, it's now called grit. Right? Grit. grit. I want my kid to have grit. <laughs> right? That's intense. And yeah, well, <laughs> all of it around kids is intense. Like, they need to be bored. <laughs> but, um, so, there is a great deal of interest, in particular, trying to talk to people about positive psychology and trying to frame things in a more positive way so that you can go from, this was all my fault, to this situation is difficult. Do you know what I mean? And there's exercises to come out of that. I've done that with some people, like as seminars and workshops, and it's actually really interesting. It's fairly empowering to know that you can control the noise in your head to some extent, right? But the key point of it that I like to make whenever I give that kind of talk is to say, this is not the solution to everything, right? This is how you feel more in control of what's happening, I think. And there's lots of other system things that need to change. There's community level things that you need to change. But this is, there are things that you can start to think about that can frame things in a more positive way if you want to start from there. Great, well, I think on that note, we will bring this session to a close. Um, in terms of one of the comments I was thinking, uh, my, my, us my usual expression of interacting with people to get to the actual emotion was, you know, when I would ask somebody about how they were doing, yeah. and they'd say, fine, <laughs> and I would just respond, well, you should tell your face that. And also, you know, how to be popular, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, our talk with one group, we're in, uh, we're looking at, we call, we call it In Search of Civility. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you can split the room in half. The older, more seasoned uh, physicians would all say, we don't have a problem here. But the other half mm -hmm. said, oh my God, we got a problem here. And so it's not even self-evident to that degree. So I, I'm supposed to come up here and shake your hand and thank you, but I'm gonna give you a hug. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Blair, a couple enough. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, our next event is actually going to happen on the, uh, it's, it's going to be the 19th annual Alloway Lecture, which, which is going to take place in two weeks on Thursday, April 25th. Joe Finns will be presenting on Disorders of Consciousness and Disability Rights, Why Science and Humanities Must Converse. 
Uh, the lecture will take place <coughs> at the Medical Sciences Building at One King's College Circle, room 2173. Uh, if you're currently not receiving weekly notices about our seminars, please stop by the table in the front and add your name uh, to the list, and it's a yellow sheet. We'll definitely um, be happy to add you as uh, onto our email correspondence. Any CBS students here uh, enrolled in the CBS summer uh, student summer course, please sign up on the attendance sheet.